Hello anatomy friends, this is Dr. Alsip, and in this video we will be discussing the osteology for the shoulder, brachial plexus, and arm session. Pay attention to some of these structures as attachment sites for some of the muscles we will be identifying and discussing today. So I'll point those out as we identify the structure. But we will start off easy with the clavicle. Again, this is a bone we have discussed from day one often referred to as the collarbone and easily palpable from where it articulates with the sternum to its other major articulation with the acromion, so the acromial uh, part of the clavicle, to form the acromioclavicular joint. So again, here is the acromion of the scapula. To me, this is one of the most dominant structures of the scapula, and it actually can vary in width and size, and that variability can affect structures that run deep to it. So you're gonna have structures running under this area right here, uh, such as the supraspinatus tendon. Projecting anteriorly, as you can see here, is the coracoid process. So you can see the coracoid process here as well. This process is not nearly as large as the acromion, but it has lots of things attaching to it, including ligaments associated with both the acromioclavicular and shoulder joints. Additionally, muscles attach here as well, and we've talked previously that the pectoralis minor muscle attaches here, but more aligned with today's session, it will have, or it will be a proximal attachment for the coracobrachialis. It has coraco right in its name as well as the short head of the biceps brachii. Only the short head, the long head, will not attach on the coracoid process. Located laterally, you will have a shallow depression called the glenoid fossa. Sometimes you hear it referred to as the glenoid cavity. So right here. And this is the socket in the shoulder ball and socket joint, and this is where the head of the humerus will articulate. And just notice how shallow this region is, particularly in comparison to the head of the humerus. So this plays a role in why the shoulder joint is so mobile. You don't have such a tight fit between the bones, but also part of the reason why it is less stable. Moving to the proximal humerus, first off, again, here is the head of the humerus, which is the ball of the shoulder ball and socket joint. And now you can really see the fit between those two structures. Opposite the head of the humerus is the greater tubercle. So laterally placed on the proximal humerus. I always think opposite the head. The head always has to be facing medially. This is called the greater tubercle because it is larger than the lesser tubercle, which you can see right here. And this is because it's larger because it will have three of the four rotator cuff muscles distally attaching here. Those rotator cuff muscles whose bellies are located posteriorly. Now more anteriorly placed is the lesser tubercle, which I outlined right here. And this is smaller as only one muscle attaches here, or one of those rotator cuff muscles. Between the greater and the lesser tubercles is a long but slender depression called the intertubecular sulcus. Sometimes you hear it referred to as the bicipital groove, and that's because the proximal tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii muscle will be located here. And during life, there will be a ligament that kind of crosses over and connects the two tubercles and allows kind of like a tunnel-like region for that tendon and to keep the tendon, that lo the long head of the biceps brachii in its place during movements. Just distal to the tubercles is a relatively thin portion of the humerus. And you can see it's pretty thick here. It starts getting a little bit thicker down here. And this region is called the surgical neck of the humerus. 
And this region is a named region due to the relatively higher frequency of fractures that occur here when you're talking about the humerus. So if you have a humeral fracture, it's not uncommon for it to occur at this surgical neck region. The axillary nerve, which is innervating the deltoid muscle and the humeral circumflex arteries of the axillary artery will wrap around the surgical neck region and may be affected with a fracture here. Moving to the distal humerus, hopefully a review from the last session, you will have this spool-shaped trochlea, which serves as an articulation site for the trochlear notch of the ulna. So this is forming the humero-ulnar joint, which is the true elbow joint, even though it's very closely associated with other joints in this region. Looking at a lateral view of the ulna, I know I'm looking at a lateral view because of this notch, this depression right here. And this is called the radial notch. And this will articulate with the head of the radius forming the proximal radio ulnar joint. So this notch needs to be facing laterally in order to articulate with the lateral radius. radius because recall the ulna is medial in the forearm, the radius is lateral. The olecranon is this very prominent structure in the proximal and posterior portion of the ulna. It's, it's very robust, and this is because it is the distal attachment site of the triceps brachii muscle, which is a very large muscle. And just anterior to the olecranon is the trochlear notch. And this is the semilunar shaped notch, which will articulate with the trochlea of the humerus to form the true elbow joint. So that trochlea will articulate with the trochlear notch. Last for today in terms of the osteology is the radius. Always pretty distinctive to me is this proximal button shaped head of the radius which will articulate with both the capitulum of the humerus, but also the radial notch of the ulna that we just looked at to form the proximal radial ulnar joint. So that head will fit right here in this radial notch. And this allows rotation of the radial head at the notch. Just distal to the head of the radius is this buildup of bone called the radial tuberosity. Anytime you have a mounding of bone, this typically means something attached there, like a tendon or a ligament during life. And the more, say, the individual uses the muscle and pulls on the bone, that will cause more bony buildup in that region, and the more likely the bony prominence is larger. In this case, the radial tuberosity is the distal attachment of the biceps brachii muscle allowing it to cross both the elbow as well as the proximal radial ulnar joints, thus being able to affect actions at both. All right, excellent. Thank you for your time and attention here. And as always, please feel free to reach out with any questions.